You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. This is the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. Before we start today's show, investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics, and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting www.optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC. Nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell securities or to provide investment advice. Welcome to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. OIC was created in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. And the Wide World of Options radio show is one of the ways the message is spread. OIC also offers a variety of other resources to those interested in learning more about options, including webinars, podcasts, and live events. For more information, check out www.optionseducation.org. Now, here's your host, OIC's Director of Retail Education, Ed Modla. It's time to break down the latest option strategies. It's time for Strategy Spotlight. I'm very excited about our conversation today with Carrie Given, PhD, also known as Dr. Duke. Carrie is the founder and managing director of Parkwood Capital. I often see Carrie out on the scene in the industry providing educational classes for investors. He's very good at what he does, very well known and respected in the industry. Thanks for being uh, here with me today, Carrie. Uh, can you start just with a little bit about your background and the business that you're doing at Parkwood Capital? Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Uh, Parkwood was founded back in 2007, uh, shortly after the third time I retired from my corporate life. Um, I spent most of my corporate life with Amico. I have a PhD in chemistry, and I started with some research and development with Amico and was there about nine years, and in the last ten years, I was in the IT management side so that when... Um, BP bought Amico. I was managing IT for the chemical company. And in fact, that introduced me to options because when I left uh, Amico, I realized that I had entirely too much Amico stock and I read about uh, selling calls. And so I trimmed down my Amico stock over a period of several months just selling calls uh, every every month on a section of the stock. And, uh, and when I got it down to the portion that I felt was appropriate for my portfolio, I uh, just then went on and learned more about selling options and buying options and the different strategies. 
Well, that's a, that's a heck of a story, and uh, it sounds like you, you took a, an unconventional path. It's always interesting to see uh, where people come from in the industry, but you discovered options and you've ran with it. I know you give a lot of very useful uh, courses for investors, both online and in person. Today, I'd really like to pick your brain about the iron condor strategy. Uh, but before we get to the options part, I always like to start with the market analysis. I often get asked the question of you know, how do you perform uh, an analytics on the market to form an opinion? And that certainly is the first step before getting into the trade. So let's start there. Uh, when you execute trades such as the iron condor, Kerry, are you looking at, at volatility or stock direction? And what type of metrics are you using or studies uh, are you using to form that opinion? Well, I... Um I'm a fairly simple trader in the sense that I don't get into a lot of esoteric uh, 50 different technical indicators or anything like that. I primarily watch the S&P 500 and trading volume and the 50 and 200 day moving averages and also uh, some of the simplistic uh, candlestick patterns. I mean, for example, recently what you're seeing when you see the um, S&P drop back, like it's pulled back twice during November, and it almost always bounces very quickly. And where you see it at the bottom of that uh, decline is you very often see the lower shadow on the candlestick being pretty long. And it's important to realize why does that happen. It, it happens because the price gets bid down, and then suddenly it gets to a price where everybody says, wow, this is, this is a good price, I'm going to get in. And it pushes the price back up before that day of trading is over. And so I watch for those signs as just kind of uh, the signals of what the tug of war in the marketplace is, where, it, where the status is. And uh, so that's one of my major ways that I track it. I also compare the S&P 500 to the Russell 2000, because the Russell is primarily small mid-cap stocks. Typically, they're the stocks that um, investors, especially large institutional traders, pile into when they think that the bull market is really taking off because those typically are high beta stocks. Conversely, when they are scared about the market, those are the first ones they sell. So I'm always comparing the Russell to the S&P to kind of get a feel for how bullish or how bearish it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's great. So that's tracking some major indices along with, with uh, technical studies as well to get that opinion going. Uh, now that we sort of know or at least have an idea of, of what you're looking at and, and how you're determining where the market might be headed, you know, how does the iron condor get put together? What market outlook or what expectation does the investor have that might lead them to consider using this strategy? Well, the iron condor is kind of interesting because um, I would say if you're trading it on the broad market index indices like uh, S&P, for example, uh, you're probably looking for kind of a wandering sideways market, ideally. But if you if you want to trade it in what I call non-directional style, and what I mean by that is instead of trying to predict where the market's going, sometimes I decide, well, I'm just going to react to the market. I'm going to trade what I see today. And you can use the Iron Condor very effectively in that way by establishing a position and then having various... Um, lines in the sand, if you will, that if the market goes to this level, I'm going to make this adjustment. If it drops to here, I'm going to make that adjustment, but I'm not really trying to predict what's happening next. I'm just handling my risk so that I never get in trouble and I make the adjustments, maybe close it out altogether on one side. But uh, that's sort of the non-directional style. And in fact, my second book, which is titled Time is Money, goes entirely into that just trying to use that as a style of trading where you're basically just uh, profiting from time decay of your options. Yeah, it's not surprising to hear that. You know, like investing, especially with options, are such a, a versatile product. There's different ways to go about it, and you outlined a few of those. So now let's get into the options part specifically. Uh, can you explain what the strategy is, uh, what are the pieces, and what does the risk profile look like? Sure. The, um, what you basically do is you sell a call spread up above the index or the stock price, whichever way you're, whichever underlying you're using. And, um, and then you also sell a put spread down below the price. And in effect, your profitability is controlled by whether the stock or index price stays in between those two spreads over the life of the trade. 
And, and of course, there's a lot of variables here. The farther out you go with your spreads, the higher the probability of success is, but the smaller the returns. And so, and then of course, the thing about a high probability trade that a lot of people forget about, I can set up a, a trade where my spreads are very far out of the money and I have a 95% probability of success, but I'm only gonna make maybe five or 10% on my um, profit at the optimal case. What people forget about is that there's a low probability, maybe it's only 5%, low probability of a very large loss. And if, if it's, uh, let's, let's say for example, I've got a $10 spread on each side, then my if my profit is $5, then that means I've got a $995 maximum loss. So I'm looking at a small gain versus a maximum loss that's quite large but of course it has a small probability of happening. And so the key here is risk management. You have to always keep in mind that big loss that's looming out there and be sure that you never take that loss because you can you can put on those type of spreads and maybe win all year or even 18 months and think, wow, I've discovered a great way to make money. And all of a sudden you take one of those losses and you've wiped out all those gains. So it, the risk management is absolutely crucial for this type of strategy. Yeah, that's, that's well said, and uh, I often say myself that, that that relationship you described and outlined there, the risk-reward and the probability of success, you know, they go hand-in-hand, hand and uh, you have to sacrifice one to get the other. I do want to pick apart the strategy a little bit, get into risk management as you talked about, but before we do there, let me cover something real quick. We've got listeners from all over the world who trade different products. Uh, when you're doing a strategy like this, are there differences from one product to the next, for example, between using stock options versus index options, you, you outlined that a bit earlier. Yes, uh, there are. If you're if you're using an iron condor on a stock, uh, first of all, your your risk is higher simply because it's on just that one stock. I mean, it, it's like any trade. Any trade I put on on Apple, for example. Well, if I wake up one morning and and see that uh, one of the uh, CFOs for Apple has been hauled into court or something or whatever, well, suddenly my stock is going to be in the tank. And, and maybe it'll recover, maybe it won't, but that's the kind of what I call event risk that I that I suffer or am exposed to when I have a trade just on a stock. So if I have an iron condor on a stock, I have to always keep in mind that I have that risk. If you're on an index, that's one of the biggest advantages is that event risk is now spread over the entire market. And you still have it. You can still have a war breakout or something like that. But, but the event risk is a lot. Uh, it's spread over a lot more um, companies. And then the other aspect to keep in mind there, of course, that if um, in any case I have to be sure that I understand that stock. If I'm trading on a particular stock, the only way I would trade an, or recommend that someone trade an iron condor on a stock is one that they've owned for a while and understand and have seen the patterns. So if you know your stock, you would have periods of time that probably are very suitable for that uh, particular trade. That, that's great explanation. I don't usually hear uh, those types of uh, explanations on the event risk between stocks and indices and then the, uh, the familiarity, you call that, that intimate knowledge of the stock itself. It was one of the advantages when I traded professionally on the floor, knowing those stocks really well gives you a big advantage and you need to have that. So that was uh, really well said. Coming back to the strategy once it's in place, uh, of course, options investors are monitoring the position constantly. Is there an approach to position management that you prefer when you're um, tracking the position, maybe making adjustments, uh, something you'd like to share with us on the position management side? Sure. There, there's a lot of different ways to adjust or manage an iron condor. The simplest one that I always recommend to my uh, coaching students to start with, uh, and in fact the beauty of it is I've had new students that um, the first year they've been trading the iron condor on the indices, they would be profitable at the end of the year with just a simple adjustment strategy, and that's what we call the 200% rule. Essentially what you do is this. If I put on the spread, let's say I put on the call spread for a dollar just to make it easy, I would track that, and each day I'd be looking at it and saying to myself, okay, if I wanted to close this spread today, what would I have to spend to close it? What would be my debit to close? 
And once my debit to close gets to $2, or in other words, twice the credit that I originally put it on for, then that's my trigger, and I close that spread. And I do the same thing on the put side. So the beauty of that um, approach is that, generally speaking, your worst-case scenario, when you, when you trigger that, it closes one side or the other for approximately loss of that credit plus an equal credit. Well, the equal credit is probably what you're going to profit on on the other side because if the market rose and, and hit uh, triggered your 200% rule, rule on the call side, most likely your put side is, is in great shape and it's going to expire worthless and you'll get your full profit there. So typically when the 200% rule triggers, you're somewhere close to break even, maybe even a small gain or a small loss, but you're, you're not in good, bad shape at all. So I've had new students in a choppy market put on Iron Condors on SBX, for example, and after a year, maybe the 200% rule tripped them out 10 out of 12 months. But the two months, they had a profit, and they didn't take some uh, large losses so that they ended up profitable for the year. And so that's a very, the 200% rule is a very effective but yet very simple strategy to control your risk. Yeah, keeping it simple is, is always a, a good idea, and it's nice to hear the detail you explain there, specific sort of rule-based approach uh, to risk management. Nothing wrong with that either. You know, Kerry, one of the questions I get about the Iron Condor strategy comes with uh, respect to entering and exiting, or when you open and close positions, investors will say, well, do you like to open all four sides at once, or leg in and leg out, and then when you exit the position, are you are you closing it out always before expiration? So what kind of comments would you have about that question centered around opening and then closing the positions? Okay, if I'm trading the uh, iron condor on an index, on a broad market index like S&P, um, and I'm doing it non-directionally, then I will I will enter it at the same time every month. For example, I'm typically entering those about 60 days to expiration. So at any given point in time, I'll have two positions where one is out a couple months and one is in the current month. And uh, so I entered about 60 days. I will position them at about 1.2 standard deviations out of the money. One of the mistakes that people make is they will try and position their spreads always at, uh, say, $100 out or some dollar number. And that doesn't make sense because when volatility is high, you're really at much more risk at that position. And if volatility is a low, it may be very, uh, just very insignificant credits there. And so if you calculate a standard deviation, that takes volatility into account. So that's how I position those at about 1.2 standard deviations. And so you position them, you enter it to about 60 days, about 1.2 standard deviations out. You can also approximate that standard deviation with the delta of the short option because about a roughly 85, 90% probability, if you look at the delta of that short option on each spread of being around 10 to 15, then you're roughly in that 85% probability area or about one standard deviation each way. And so that's one way to approximate it, just look at the delta of those short options. But I try to mm -hmm. do that consistently every month and, and trade it that way. Now, the opposite example that you can use an iron condor for, and it's much riskier, is right before an earnings announcement. If you look at an individual stock, calculate the uh, price to straddle, that gives you the expected range of the move the next day. And so then you look at the condors that where you could sell a call spread out outside of that move on the top side and sell a put spread down below the expected range. And I'll look at those and if I can if I can set up that spread where I maybe have a potential of say fifteen, twenty percent gain and my lower break even on it is roughly at the support level for that stock over the past few months, then I might do that. The advantage there in Condor there is that as volatility collapses after the announcement, profitability of your iron condor actually increases because it's a negative vega trade. And uh, But that is, I'll emphasize to your listeners, that's a risky trade. I always view the earnings trades as um, binary trades. It's like flipping a coin. You're either going to be right or wrong. So don't place any money in that trade that you're not willing to lose because you're not going to have a chance to adjust it. 
Well, the, the approaches that you described there are very sound, and, and thank you for providing all that, that wonderful detail along with it. Now, when investors trade options here, I want to close with this question for you. You already mentioned maybe a, a, a lesson learned that investors have or a mistake they make with respect to strike prices. And I always like to ask experts like yourself after uh, so many years in the business and teaching students, you know, any other common errors or lessons learned that you've witnessed that you think our listeners should avoid or be aware of? Um, probably I think the one I've seen in a lot of my students <clears throat> is that they, um, uh, they scale up too quickly, too large, too, too fast. Um, people, they'll take a coaching class from me. I mean, even my longest coaching class will be about 20, 21 uh, sessions, but many of the courses are shorter, maybe six or seven weeks. And, and they'll think at the end of that period, I need to put my entire hundred thousand dollar account to work. And they don't realize that they don't know near enough because they may have learned some theory from me, but experience is really critically important. And um, and so I always coach them to just start out with one contract. Even if you're trading condors, just trade one contract or two contracts technically in each spread and uh, and do that for a while and just see how that works. Learn from doing and watching the market and seeing how it behaves. And, uh, and also the important thing is to convince students that this market is not going to be the same next year. It, it's always changing, and it's very important to get the experience to realize that without just jumping in with both feet, and before long you don't have an account to trade with if you've made some critical mistakes early on. So that's the biggest mistake yeah. I will make. Yeah, that's, that's great, it, and it's Patience is key, of course, uh, and uh, it's not easy because uh, greed can set in when people uh, start to think about the kind of returns they can get. They want to start right away and jump in a little bit too too much too quickly. So that was uh, really well said. Kerry, any, any closing thoughts about the strategy or about the business or um, uh, how investors could find out more about Parkwood Capital if they wanted to reach out? Well, I guess... Um I guess in terms of this, the strategy in the business, one of the things that I would caution everybody, I often give talks at some of these Money Show uh, Traders Expo kind of conferences on what I call um, the hype or no hype uh, trading. The, the marketing hype that's in this business is very unfortunate because there's too many people out there that are trying to convince you that you can turn your $2,000 into a million, and that just simply isn't true, and it's just unfortunate. Because what it does is it prevents people from realizing the power in options that are, can be used very conservatively. So I, that's one of the messages that I try to put out as often as I can because it's I feel like a lot of people could benefit from options, but they don't because of some of the craziness that's being preached out there. And in terms of learning more about uh, my business, you can find my website at parkwoodcapitalllc.com. And I... I have several services there you can take advantage of, as well as quite a few um, free downloads of white papers, uh, for example, an Excel spreadsheet where you can calculate standard deviations and things like that. And you can always see some of my uh, current courses or um, trading services as well. Great. Excellent talk today, Kerry. Again, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us, and thanks for joining me here today on Strategy Spotlight. Thank you, Ed. It's nice to talk to you. Ready for a little nostalgia? It's time to take a look back. Back in the late 1990s and early 2000s, a couple of uh, events happened in the industry that really changed the way execution and prices functioned in the options industry, and this is specifically decimalization and multiple exchange listing. For those of you who have been involved with options more recently than that time frame. You might not be familiar with these terms. So each occurred around the same time and had a significant effect on the industry as a whole. First, let's look at decimalization. For the vast majority of the history of the stock market, shares were, were traded in fractions, eighths and quarters and sixteenths and so on. Similar, similarly, options were also traded in fractions. When I started in the business in the late 1990s on the trading floor, we were quoting options in fractions. I was a professional market maker on the trading floor, and if an option was worth $3, my market might be two and seven-eighths bid offered at three and an eighth. That's 
25 cents wide, and that's just about the best market you could possibly get, even in the actively traded securities. A one-eighth wide market was really just unheard of. You never heard of that of that type of a bid-ask spread, and that would still be 12.5 cents wide. Then comes decimalization. In the late 90s, the SEC ordered all exchanges to submit a plan to convert to decimal pricing. This is for stock trading and options trading. And then by April 9th of 2001, the industry had completed the entire conversion. Bid-ask spreads tightened dramatically as the smallest price increment was now a penny as compared to the 12.5 cents one-eighth wide spreads that I talked about earlier. That's a huge difference, and it took away most of the edge that professional traders were used to capturing that really had a significantly negative impact on the professional market-making side of the business, but was, of course, very positive for the individual investor as markets got better for them. Now, shifting to multiple listing, following along that same time frame as decimalization in the late 90s, uh, options on a particular stock were only traded on one exchange. In other words, every order you set for execution was only accepted by one exchange with a relatively limited amount of market makers taking the other side. In the spirit of competition, the industry evolved and allowed multiple listing where each exchange was allowed to list options on any security they wish. Obviously, this resulted in much greater competition. When you put the effects of decimalization and multiple listing together, the result was much tighter bid-ask spreads with greater depth, and that's good for the individual investor. While the market-making community certainly did suffer, it was to the great benefit of the larger pool of market participants, and benefiting investors is the priority of both the options exchanges and the financial industry as a whole. And that's today's Looking Back. Next, let's upgrade your options toolbox with cutting-edge trading platforms, devices, and information. Let's talk about tools, resources, and good reads. The first step prior to executing any options strategy is forming an opinion on market direction, or maybe on volatility as well. For many investors who aren't used to performing market analytics, it can be a challenge to find out or figure out what is your method going to be. A stock screener is a tool that can be used to help filter through the market and select stocks of interest based on criteria that is important to you. Zach's Research, whose homepage is www.zax.com, has a tab titled Screening from which you can further select Stock Screener. There's some features here that require a subscription, but many free filters, including market capitalization. You can set a limit or a minimum on how large the company is, price-to-earnings ratios. You can set ranges on how expensive you are looking for the stock to be, dividend yields, whether or not they pay a dividend and how much that is, average volume, and others. Also, a very nice additional feature, uh, one of the reasons why I selected it here, is the ability to limit the results to only show stocks which list options contracts. That's very nice to know. And again, that's www.zax.com. In addition to screening the market for stocks which fit meaningful criteria to you from a data or technical perspective, it's also important to keep an eye on the headlines. Zero Hedge provides a mixture of news stories and perspective with a heavy focus on trading and the markets. You can follow regular contributors if you'd like or just scroll through the long list of articles. They span the range from political commentary to economic and many others. It's an excellent resource to keep you well informed on important news of the day with a special focus in the financial world. It's at www.zerohedge.com. If you're looking for a good book to read, The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham is a good choice. Originally published in 1949, but still popular today, Benjamin Graham's star student was Warren Buffett, who described this book as, quote, by far the best book on investing ever written, end quote. Graham is widely recognized as a pioneer, if not the pioneer, in the field of value investing. His book, 
walks through a methodical, mostly rules-based approach to stock selection and managing risk. You'll hear that interesting story of Mr. Market, who's a hypothetical investor that makes decisions based purely on emotion. It's a clever way to describe the psychology of investing and maybe how to avoid those mistakes that come along with using your emotions to make trading decisions. You'll also read about other topics, speculating versus investing, market returns versus inflation, and margin of safety, which really gets into the managing risk portion. It's certainly uh, well worth your time to check out The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. And that's today's tools, resources, and good reads. We love connecting with our listeners. With that in mind, let's take a moment to answer a few questions on OIC's Wide World of Options Q&A segment. A few really good questions on industry happenings today. First from Jason. If you buy an options contract and then sell it, are you responsible for giving the next buyer 100 shares if they exercise their rights? Really important question for someone who's getting started with their options education or beginning to trade. Options are fungible, and the clearing process separates any connection you have to the original seller of the option you purchase. That means if you sell to close a contract after buying it, you have no ongoing rights or obligations. When you're entering these orders into your platform, you may be selecting buy to open, sell to close. And if you do execute a closing transaction, the position no longer exists, which means those rights or obligations disappear. Next question from Nikolai. Is the implied volatility priced such that the trade is zero sum if the stock moves according to that implied volatility level? It's a great question. Let me just take a step back first and talk volatility from a more broad perspective. We know that historic volatility represents past movements of the stock. It's historical. It's looking back, and it's factual. It can be measured using various time frames, 10 days, 30 days, or whatever else you choose. It's also known as realized volatility. We look back and we know what it is. Options are priced looking into the future. While it's certainly relevant to know what the historic or realized volatility was, options need to incorporate an expectation of what volatility will be from today until expiration. This is known as impl implied volatility, and it only exists in options. The answer to the question centers around the fact that implied volatility does not imply direction. A stock might experience the expected level of fluctuation as the implied vol predicted, but the moves in share price could be higher or lower. Obviously, this would not yield a zero sum. If the question further stipulated that you bought a call option, that the realized volatility of the stock matched the implied level when you bought the option, and this resulted from the shares moving higher and not due to back and forth fluctuating share prices, then you'd be closer and it would be more accurate and fair to say that the result of the trade would be closer to zero sum given all of those circumstances. Great questions from both Jason and Nikolai. Thanks for sending them in. Look forward to answering more of them next time. And that's today's Industry Happenings. You've been listening to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. If you have any questions about anything you've heard on today's show, email edmodla at options at the OCC.com or visit www.optionseducation.org and chat with Investor Services. Interested in connecting with OIC on social media? Like the OIC page on Facebook. Follow them on Twitter at options underscore edu and Instagram at options education. And follow their page on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening and be sure to tune in to the next episode of Wide World of Options. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. 
Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 